probably uh, some kind of a hunk of a guy because you know that time he had this long hair, uh, hippie kind of look. I always liked her when I met her in college, but never, never proposed to her because maybe because of some ego and all that. I I remember uh, you know the. I mean, the first thing I remember is her smile, which is what I like the most. Uh, I had seen him volunteering a lot in uh, uh, church, and I really, you know, recognized that he's a man of God. Actually, I have more weird habits than him. <laughs> I think the way he uses his toothpaste, yeah. He's very organized and disciplined. So oh, that's not weird. Uh, that is not weird. That's so. Like she likes to cut onions and uh, mix chili and salt and eat even <laughs> though you make the most delicious food and keep it on the table she'll go and chop onions I find him to be you know kind of too meticulous which is kind of weird like you know which side you put the towel to dry every every day you know I find that kind of weird there's a there's a science to it I'll, I'll, I'll tell you later. <laughs> Obviously her, like, picking up the fight. <laughs> oh, ho. oh, really? I think she's very patient. So normally, even if I pick up a fight, she forgives. He's the first one to pick a fight. <laughs> and to forgive also, right? Not really. <laughs> Actually, no, we, we, I think we're mixed, right? Sometimes we do fight, but then one thing is, like, we never ever let the sun go down on our anger, you know? Even if though we don't verbally say sorry to each other, uh, at night, we probably just just this, just a hand over each other, or something which just says that you know I'm sorry, you've forgiven each other. Both are equal. Sometimes it's um, it's mom, and sometimes it's dad. He's very strict. After they've gone to bed, and he like you know gets into their room every night, and sometimes I like wonder what what he's doing. And then he would go, uh, you know, into their rooms, and I would see him, like, you know, put put his hands over them and pray over them. So I think that's the sweetest dad moment. Uh, there are times when I'm like, I'm beating myself. I I ought to do this. I should have done that. And, you know, but then when I look at them, I'm like, I mean, I've got a bigger father. So why worry? So that's one thing which I've learned from the kids. Greetings and thank you so much for tuning in to Living Strong today. As always, it's our joy, it's our privilege to come your way and spend this time with you uh, in the Word of God and also take some time to pray uh, with you. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about marriage and family. Uh, we've spent a couple of uh, programs talking about marriage. And uh, now we are just, uh, uh, this, these two episodes, we're talking about parenting. And uh, on the program today, we especially want to talk about parenting teenagers and young adults. Children, of course, are going to grow up and become teenagers and young adults. And, and uh, working with them is, of course, something that's totally different from uh, their early uh, childhood years. Uh, on the program today, we have uh, two special guests. We have uh, Jean George, uh, who is a professional uh, mental health counselor. And uh, she has a degree, a master's degree in psychiatric social work. She began her uh, early career as a school counselor, but uh, as a development coordinator in a child-centered uh, NGO. She's also worked as a consultant uh, in the Department of Psychiatry with the Medical College Hospital here in Bangalore. Uh, currently, she has her own private practice and uh, spends a lot of time working with people from co in the corporates, uh, dealing with their, with their family and mental health uh, challenges, working with them. Uh, we also have Ranjani Isaac, who has a, a, a master's degree uh, in uh, medical and psychiatric social work. She's uh, worked in both medical and psychiatric uh, uh, settings, providing services to people with uh, mental health uh, problems. She's also specialized in the area of education uh, and uh, she's uh, spent several years counseling uh, students and their families, both in one-on-one -on -one and also in group family therapy settings. So uh, we are so privileged to have both of them with us. They are both part of our our uh, Christmas Counseling, which is a, a ministry of all people's church, serving our church community and others in our city uh, in the area of marriage, family, and parenting. So uh, we're going to take some time to talk about parenting, especially parenting teens, young adults, 
uh, you know, and, and uh, God has really given us as uh, believing parents the responsibility uh, to nurture our children, to train our children uh, in the ways of the Lord uh, so that when they grow up, they can continue uh, walking in those ways. And uh, there is this joy of parenting. It's like the Bible says, they're like arrows in the hands of a warrior. And you know, what a joy when, in, uh, when, a, when a warrior releases an arrow and the arrow finds its mark. I mean, it's a thrill to know that, you know, that arrow was positioned. It was released in the right way and, and it, it, it accomplished its purpose. Uh, but that doesn't happen automatically. We, you know, as parents, we have to do our part. So now, when we talk about teens, as parents, we ourselves have to change in the way we work with teenagers and, you know, gradually they become young adults. And so uh, there's this whole shift that our parents need to make. Uh, could you highlight that for us and just talk about some of these changes that parents have to make in how they work with their teenagers and young adults? It's interesting, Pastor, that you said that children grow from younger age and they grow up to be adults. Um, to be on the lighter side, I just want to say that parents don't want to grow up with their children. <laughs> and uh, right. they, they just remain sometimes there and imagine that they have children who are very young and, you know, they have to be nurtured and, you know, taken care of in that way. So this whole um, parenting team comes as a, as a, sometimes a rude shock to parents uh, because they've suddenly woken up to a to the idea that or to the reality that their little one has grown up mm. um, so that's why we said you know it's so important at the at the stage of preteen to be sensitive to the changes that are happening um, so the way you really engage with your teen is is a world different from the way you engaged with your child thus far right. so I think there's a whole lot of learning mm. that happens and uh, this is one area where we are not trained uh, to parent teens and we learn on the job mm -hmm. so probably our teens are teaching us as well so we start looking at them as people who are actually educating us about mm -hmm. themselves so we we have to participate in the bringing up of teens not as a, a, a at the level of an authority figure or an authoritarian kind of an attitude but more as a, a, a person who disciples your child the word discipline is often mistaken to be a, a, a tough method. But the word discipline is not really to do with using a harsh method, method on your child. It's more like grooming your child into a follower of something, right. you know, discipline your child right. into the identity that he has to have for himself. So it, the, the, the primary goal of parenting a teen is to bring them to that point of independence mm. where they start looking within themselves and to God for their own life. And it's not to keep policing them okay. until such time they leave your home. Right. So the, the transition is huge. Mm. And um, the kind of qualities that you need probably go through rough weather mm. and we learn over a period of time sure. that we need to change our strategies. It will be one of um, uh, participatory mm. and uh, one that is encouraging or um, you know empowering or uh, getting into a reasoning kind of a relationship where you talk one-on-one -on -one with a child, you respect the child's identity, you help them realize that they are individuals, they are unique, and they've been created by God for a particular purpose. So constantly you have this um, responsibility of communicating that to your teen. Right. And that gives the teen a stability to think, oh, I am someone. Mm. My parents respect me, right. um, so I I am an individual, and I need to find my place in this world. Right. So I think the interaction is very much different from what it is with the preteen or. Yeah, I like that. I like what you said that parents need to grow up with their children, you yeah? know, and I think that's so important. And uh, and and uh, the other thing that that you really highlighted is it's a learning process for the parents, in as much as the parents are trying to nurture their own children. You know, like we've never been to school on learn how to parent, you know, it's like you're on the job, you're learning. Uh, but it's so important, like you're, you're pointing out, that the, the parents also make the shift in how they work with their children and, uh, and really help children become uh, independent, stand on their own feet and so on. And Yeah, Jean, so would you like to add to that, this whole shift that parents need to make 
uh, working with their teenagers as they grow up to become young adults? The stage of teenagehood uh, is akin to autonomy, it's akin to responsibility, it's akin to uh, building identity. Mm. And that's something parents need to open their eyes to. Because when there is increased maturity, there is increased freedom. Mm. And when there's increased freedom, there's increased responsibility. Right. So parents need to ensure that they teach their children to be responsible. Mm and allow them to be responsible, give them avenues where they can be responsible. It's true that they may fail, but it's still important that you give them those opportunities so that they can learn from their mistakes yet be responsible as well. An additional thing that parents generally do is they stifle them with rules, only rules. Mm. So just like as they were children, they have ABC rules for them. But parents need to understand that there is no rules without a relationship. Your children will be willing to listen to you if they have a relationship with you. Absolutely. If they know uh, that you understand their strengths, their weakness, you know what interests them, then they, they would want to please you and as a result be willing to take on some of those rules, mm. of course, in discussion. But that's something that parents need to move out from because mm. as children, parents get into this mode of uh, there are instructions given for everything and it needs to be followed and there is probably no question to that. But uh, a relationship starts right from the time they're little children, right. so that when they reach up to a teenage, uh, the stage of teenage, they relate more as friends, more as, uh, uh, more as um, people who are of the same page, who are right. willing to look at different opinions. Right. So in that, in that uh, realm is where children, uh, teens, would love to listen to those rules and imbibe uh, what the parents are attempting to teach them. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I really, uh, you know, like that. that relationship and rules you, know, you just can't have rules without relationship and but it's in that environment where parents are having that relationship where they can then bring in the rules and it just reminds me about king david in the bible you know where you know absalom was of course he had uh, 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 he was having a very difficult situation his own sister had been violated uh, and David didn't do anything about it. He knew about the problem, but he ne never did anything. He just gave instructions. You know, Absalom, of course, left Jerusalem. He went away. David just said, bring him back and, you know, let him stay in his house and all this. So just instructions. But there really was no involvement from David's side in, in, in what Absalom was going in his struggle. And uh, what was the end result? We see young Absalom rebelling against his father. Uh, and then on the other hand, maybe, you know, David learned from that whole experience with Absalom. Later on, when Solomon comes along, uh, we find, uh, although we don't have, uh, you know, in, in the direct record of uh, David instructing Solomon, in, in the Proverbs, we see how Solomon talks about David. You know, Solomon says, my, my father told me, my father taught me, he said, my son, uh, get wisdom with all you're getting, get understanding. So this whole desire for wisdom in Solomon was obviously instilled by his father David. So when God appears to Solomon and says, Solomon, you ask anything, what, what do you want? The one thing he asked was for wisdom. You know, how did he know he had to ask for wisdom? It was obviously instilled in him through his father David who said, son, with all you're getting, get understanding and, and, and was instruct, uh, put in there. So, you know, just to sum that up, you know, rules without relationship, relationship is always to going to lead to rebellion. rebellion. Uh, whereas, you know, when you have that environment relationship, that's where a lot of things can happen. Now, you know, just the topic, talking about wisdom uh, and, and trying to give our children wisdom. You know, there's so many challenges uh, that teenagers and young adults face. You know, we, you know, we generally say, okay, it's all peer pressure. It's all things around them. And one of the biggest areas of challenge these days is this, uh, this whole uh, area of uh, the use of uh, social media. Uh, the acts, free access to information on the internet and so on. So a lot of parents struggle with that. You know, how much freedom should we give? Uh, how do we establish boundaries for our teenagers? Um, you know, typically teenagers may have their own mo mobile phone. Sometimes it's out of, out of a need for practical, you know, uh, use that, you know, they want to have their own device and so on. So parents give it to them. But once you give it, then they have access to everything on the internet and all kinds of things. So now, what can Christian parents do? Uh, and just trying to guide their children, navigate this whole world uh, of information that's out there and social media because of access to the internet. And what can Christian parents do? What would you suggest? We definitely have to say that uh, 
the internet and the cyberspace today is a necessary evil mm. uh, to all of us because I think in some ways we are all in need of it and we are using it uh, to the extent possible. Talking about uh, children, um, this is one of the biggest right now maladies. Uh, in fact, um, recently um, internet addiction has become one of, it has been added on to uh, other addictions as well, mm. like substance abuse and alcohol and all of these things. The latest is, it's called a gadget addiction. Mm. Gadget addiction. Um, and uh, interestingly, this is one of the biggest problems that parents are facing today. And um, many, of the, many of them come to us and say, is there a button I can push or a software that I can install so that I, my child is safe um, in the cyberspace and uh, he does everything. Uh, but um, unfortunately, I don't think uh, there is anything like that mm. uh, that can fully guarantee that uh, your child is safe uh, in the cyberspace. Uh, so, which means, you know, parents have to take on that responsibility, assume that responsibility of monitoring to some extent uh, how the child is using um, uh, this particular uh, area of their life, the, the internet space and the cyberspace, and uh, for which Unfortunately, the older generation is not so familiar as mm. the younger generation. So, one of the first things I think I did is, as a parent, I tried to figure out what is really um, happening. How do I use these gadgets? How do, what, what are the apps that you can have? Um, what are mo monitors and what are filters? And I think every parent has the ability to figure out that. So, it's better to be in the know right. of how these things work than to, you know, say I am plead ignorance and say I don't know what my child is doing, I have no idea how this works. I think it's important for parents to get, especially parents of younger children, because I think today the access doesn't begin for an older child, it's, it's for a much younger child. True. We've seen little children using iPads to keep themselves entertained. Right. And parents give it to them freely because they are busy otherwise. They'd rather the child watch something than run around somewhere. So, um, figure out what are the things that you do and see what are the apps. That I, I think every, um, um, th there are apps to monitor the amount of time your child spends on Facebook, mm. on uh, Netflix and all of these things. And there are statistics to show that nearly 90% of teenagers starting from the age of 8, 9 upwards are on the one single social media Facebook mm. and uh, uh, there are good things, there are bad things. Uh, it's important for us to educate the child about um, what it means to be a cyber citizen, mm. that's what they call them and say what are the dangers of being a cyber citizen. The moment you're there, you're out there and you're permanently there, right. there's nobody can take away anything that you've done there. Uh -huh. So the dangers that will come with that, which is a question of their reputation and um, probably their future and whatever. So it's important for us to keep that. In. At home, there are many things that you can do. Uh, maybe have a, a curfew on the amount of time mm -hmm. a child spends on the, uh, on the internet. Maybe have all the gadgets in a place which everybody can see. So there is no privacy for gadgets which they can misuse mm -hmm. or abuse in their own private space. There are several things that you can do within the home to control um, the use of internet right. and internet space um, so that your child is safe, but it's, it is a huge responsibility. Yeah, Ranjini, that, those were very important thoughts there, and especially in dealing with this whole challenge uh, of social media. And, and along with that, you know, we are aware that parents have to deal with things like studying, uh, which is a big, a big deal here, especially uh, uh, in India and Asia, uh, you know, getting children are uh, working with children in their educational uh, journey uh, and also definitely in other areas like faith and purity and we are aware that children are uh, in teenagers and as they grow up into young adults they are exposed to so many ideas ideologies philosophies uh, around uh, in out in the world and uh, I think uh, you know we should not uh, uh, we should not necessarily try to put a tight rein on children and try to hold them back because they are going to explore ideas and things around them at some point. But I think it's so important for us to instill in them those, those values. It will help them make choices, uh, the right choices as they make the journey. Uh, you know, we, are get, we have to kind of wrap up our program today, but I want to close by just asking, you know, this, cha this challenging question that, you know, 
in as much as uh, as believers, as parents, we do our best to uh, nurture our children, to work with our teenagers as they grow up into becoming young adults. Now, we do our best. We do everything we know we, we are supposed to do. But what if a, a, a teenager, a young adult, as they grow up, uh, show signs of wandering away from things we know are right? You know, what if we see them, you know, just dabbling with things in the world? They want to experiment. They want to go out and discover and they want to explore. They're curious. And so they begin to dabble with different things, and uh, which seem like they're going astray from the right path that we, we want them to walk in. How should a believing parent respond? How should they relate to their child, to their teenager, young adult at that stage? If you could just talk about that, it'll be great, I think. I think the first thing that comes to my mind is um, when your child goes astray, you should respond to your child in love. Mm because that is the time when it's hardest for you to love your child. Um, do not give up on your child. I know it's difficult for a parent to go through that, but you should remember that God has not given up on your child. Okay? So you keep that in mind and don't throw up your hands. Um, intercede for your child. Do everything you can in love to bring your child back because that is part of your finishing responsibility to God. And uh, that's why we are here as custodians, as managers. Uh, maybe you can't really influence your child in terms of talking to them or uh, following up on things that they do, or you feel you're already distanced, but it doesn't matter. One of the best ways you can really cover for your child is to intercede for your child. Right. Uh, bring your child because you know there is somebody greater who's right. interceding on your child's behalf. So you got to really keep your heart and your arms open, right. just like the father who let his prodigal son go away, right. but he stood there and waited and waited until the son came back Absolutely. and received him with open arms. Right. So I think that is really a challenge, but it is doable. Right. It is doable. Mm -hmm. Jenny, you want to quickly add anything to that? I think there's no bigger lesson that we can learn apart from what we know of the prodigal son. Mm. So when children go astray, parents either uh, uh, there are two extremes, they're either too passive or they're too aggressive. Mm. But then the Bible tells us what is the way that we are to respond, unconditional love. The father opened his arms waiting for the son to come back and uh, gave him the best of things. Uh, although it's difficult for parents to do that, but we have a model. Mm. And we know that there is a blessing when, when parents do receive their children in love, even when they go astray, because we are demonstrating the love of the father. Right. That's, that's amazing. Thank you so much for being with us here. You know, we're getting ready to close off uh, the program and in fact, this entire series on marriage and family. You know, parents, uh, we have a, a great job. I, I, don't, I wouldn't say a job, but a great ministry that God has entrusted to us in nurturing our children. And as we, as we just heard, even if you see children, you know, kind of going astray, never give up, never stop loving them. Uh, it's like what God says. He says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. And with loving kindness, I have drawn you in Jeremiah 31. And that's the love of God that we need to release that will draw them back in uh, to the ways of the Lord. And the Bible reminds us there in Romans 2, 4, that it's the goodness of God uh, that leads us to repentance. It's just the pull of the goodness of God that brings us back uh, into right relationships. So don't give up on your children. Keep praying. Take the promises of God. Go before God. Uh, stand before God for your children and uh, remember like as Joshua said as for me and my house we will serve the Lord and we want to pray that with you for you upon you uh, before we close this program let's pray together father we just thank you for the opportunity to spend this time talking discussing learning and uh, father we pray for every home for every marriage every family uh, where people have been watching us and we pray that each of our homes oh God will be homes according to your word where Lord we would say as for me and my house we will serve the Lord that the children you've given us will rise up and grow up to become the men and the women that you want them to be becoming mighty on the earth for your kingdom for your name for your honor we pray this blessing father over each one watching. And by faith, we say it is done in each of our homes, our families, 
uh, over our children, over our grandchildren, that as for us and our homes and our families, we will serve the Lord. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us. And until next time, remember, live life the Jesus way. God's desire for relationship and intimate fellowship with us as sons and daughters goes way back before the foundation of the world. That means the reason God created you and me is so that he could be a father, we could be his sons and daughters, and we could be before him just covered, enveloped, surrounded, overwhelmed by his love. We have a publication called Marriage and Family. Uh, it's a, a very comprehensive book that starts from the very beginning of what marriage is. How do you go about preparing for marriage? How do you find your life partner? And then moving on into uh, essential ingredients that are necessary for building a strong marriage, uh, resolving conflicts, communication, uh, learning to put the past behind. We talk about things like uh, running your family, uh, personal finances, budgeting, and so on. And then we move on to talk a little bit about uh, parenting and so on and how to pray for your children. Uh, so this book is, uh, is, is a very important, very useful, and very concise. 